Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening and welcome to the Geological Society's first public lecture of 2019. I'm Richard Hughes and I'm the Executive Secretary of the Geological Society of London. Um, before I get on to tonight's programme, uh, just one or two housekeeping matters. Um, I hope you've been reading the screen as it's been circulating. Um, for those of you who've got mobile phones, smartphones with you, please do make sure that they're on silent. Um, we have no fire drills planned for the evening. You won't be surprised to hear. So if you do hear the fire alarm, um, we do need to evacuate the building. Um, for those of you who are in the front half of the auditorium, the escape route is uh, follow the, the green sign out through the door into the central um, Burlington House courtyard. For those of you at the rear of the building, please exit through either of the two doors over there, out through the main entrance back onto Piccadilly, and again, muster in the Burlington House courtyard. And so to this evening's events. And before I introduce Nick, just a, a plug for um, the Society's 2019 science theme. Those of you who are regulars at these events will know that for a number of years now, we've been choosing a specific theme for our annual events, talks, um, conferences, and so on. And 2019 is the year of carbon. And we invite you to join us in exploring this theme through a range of events, conferences, lectures, and educational resources that will be put on throughout the course of the year. And for details of those, please do take a look at our, at our website. Um, there's, there's a lot of information there. But this evening, I have the pleasure of introducing the Society's current president, uh, Nick Rogers, who will speak to us all this evening on the subject of the Society's own motto, Quick quid sub terra est. I had to look it up as well. Um, whatever is beneath or whatever is under the earth. And from Lednia, of course, humans have wondered what lies beneath our feet. But over the last few hundred years, visions of lost worlds and the underworld have been replaced with a really quite sophisticated and detailed understanding of the earth's structure and composition. And Nick this evening is going to explore how we've reached today's view of the mantle as a dynamic system that responds to the long-term cooling of the Earth's interior. And he will also show how volcanoes provide a window into this system through the geochemistry of erupted materials. In addition to serving as the president of the Geological Society, Nick is an emeritus professor at the, uh, of Earth Sciences at the Open University, where he ran the Trace Elements Analytical Laboratory and used his knowledge of geochemistry to address questions ranging from the origins of alkaline rocks to the evolution of mantle plumes. So please join me in welcoming Nick to the podium. Uh, thank you very much, Richard, and thank you all for turning out on this foul evening. Um, always uh, doing something in the middle of January is always a high-risk strategy, I feel. But anyway, thank you for coming. Uh, yes, quick quid of terra est... Uh, is that the, um, the societies uh, on the societies, um, what do you call it? They're not necessarily coat of arms. Imprimatur. Imprimatur, right. Oh, well, that's another word, isn't it? We can all go home with tonight. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. I, it was also, uh, I started off this afternoon with this and I'll tell it now. It was also the, uh, the, t the title of the, um, the book on the history of the society, <laughs> uh, Whatever is Under the Earth. Uh, we felt that the title should be in English, not Latin, uh, greater under public understanding. Um, that it was, uh, this was published just in, just in time for the bicentenary in 2007, and I can remember uh, the publishing house at the time. This uh, book had been in production for an extraordinarily long time. Um, and it was, we were wondering whether the author was going to peg it before the book was, um, before the book was published. And it, and it was at a time when Little Britain was very popular, and so needless to say, it very quickly became known in the publishing house as whatever. Um, <laughs> so uh, so we, we start off uh, at a low point. Anyway, I'm going to hopefully take you on a journey from uh, medieval visions of, uh, 
of, of the interior of the Earth, Dante's Inferno, uh, to helium and tungsten isotopes. Now, this is quite a long journey. Um, I dare say I'm going to lose some of you on the way, but hopefully uh, you'll find it uh, entertaining. Anyway, let's start off um, in uh, medieval times, and here we have the underworld and a convenient place for hell and the realm of the medieval uh, imagination, obviously inspired by, uh, by biblical readings. Uh, anyway, this on the left is Jacob von Swanenberg, the harrowing of hell with unmentionable things going on with strange monsters and uh, somebody looks like Madonna uh, peering down on everything in, in, in a benign, benign state, a, a completely passive state, actually, up there in heaven. And heaven only knows what's going on down here. And on the right, we have... Uh, 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 Dante's Inferno, a woodcut from a Venetian edition of the Divine Comedy, um, which uh, likewise shows a little, some, a little more order um, in, in what, what was going on, but again, inspired by, uh, by a, a vivid uh, imagination um, and probably a lack of street lights or something like that as well. Uh, but I, I would like you to note that they did actually get something, one thing right. Um, it's, uh, it's hot down there. Uh, and, and also it gets hotter towards the centre, um, even, even if what goes on down here is, is, is uh, somewhat, uh, somewhat fanciful. So there, uh, there, was, there, was, there was some... It's also, I, I was interested to see, it, it, it's layered as well. Um, so maybe they weren't so mad after all, but uh, perhaps they were. Anyway, um, it's, as I say, a realm of the medieval imagination. There's also a, a realm for the more contemporary imagination and... Uh, you know, trawling through the internet, as one does, um, I came across this wonderful uh, film poster of Kenneth Moore and Pep Mune, whoever he or she was, uh, in, in a version of Jules, Jules Verne's Journey to the Centre of the Earth. Uh, and it's got, you know, it's got volcanoes, things that might look like plesiosaurs, but unlikely, and, and sort of a shipwreck going on here. What the uh, giant King Kong ape is doing is anybody's <laughs> guess. But, anyway, but you know, apart from that, for a geologist, what's not to like about that? Um, uh, but uh, remarkably, this, 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 this poster looks, uh, comes from the 1950s. Remarkably, it was one of Kenneth Moore's last movies, and it was made in 1978, uh, which I find even more surprising. What is, what is totally alarming, though, is this is very contemporary, and, uh, and if, you put, if you do put sort of the interior of the earth, you very quickly find, find this, uh, the, 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 uh, the land of a garter, uh, which is meant to be in the centre of the earth, and it's, uh, and it's given credibility by uh, this Dr Joshua David Stone, and if you, um, and who claims it's the biggest cover-up of all time, and so on and so forth. Um, and he says at the end of that, this may be hard for some of you to believe. You're not, <laughs> you're not kidding. I know it was for me at first. However, I now have an absolute knowingness of the truth of this. Now, if anybody says they have an absolute knowingness of the truth of anything, you need to deeply suspect what they're talking about, um, particularly when it comes to the, uh, the, the, the goings-on in the interior of the earth. But, uh, but I thought I'd bring that to your attention in that uh, I, ju I just felt it needs uh, wider dissemination as, as, a, as, as, as a piece of web bollocks. Um, sorry, that's a, that's a technical term. Um, I hope that's not being broadcast. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, uh, moving on. Uh, this is the visions of the different views of the interior of the earth uh, in 1664 by a Jesuit priest, Anastasius uh, Kircher, who published a book called Mundus Subterraneus. And he, uh, after, well, he, he, was, he was a travelling Jesuit. He, he, he made extensive journeys across Europe and spent quite a lot of time at, uh, in Italy and, and studying Vesuvius. And obviously he noted, he noted that there's hot stuff in Vesuvius coming out from the interior of the earth. And, he, and so he, him, and realising that there were volcanoes in other places, developed this sort of image of a network of fiery things going on in the inside of the earth, but connected to the outside producing volcanoes. So, so Dante's Inferno has been uh, depersonalised and made into something a little more abstract. But he also noticed at Vesuvius that as well as hot stuff coming out of the volcano, like molten rock and lava that was, that was clearly hot because it glows red uh, when, it, when it's freshly erupted and cools, uh, there, were all, there were also volatiles, there was steam coming out of it and, and other gases. And so 
He, his, another, another image in the book actually illustrates that in the centre of the Earth, as well as having hot stuff in the centre, there are also these reservoirs of fluid that, must, that, that are lurking around there. And one of, and one of the... And the, these were there also, as well as to explain the mixture of, of, of both fire and water uh, in, in volcanoes, also to explain the tides. He, his, his idea was that over a period of 24 hours, the water in the oceans recedes into these reservoirs and then pops back out again. He didn't actually understand the mechanism, but, uh, but anyway, he was thinking in a, in, a, in a rational way about what the evidence of things going on at the surface were telling him about the inside of the Earth. The next stage is when, well, after, uh, when, when modern physics or modern science and natural philosophy was beginning, was beginning, to, uh, beginning to take shape. And, and scientists, or usually vicars, um, or members, members of the aristocracy, as Cavendish was, uh, were uh, trying to design, design experiments to find out about the Earth. And this is one in particular that uh, I didn't really know about until I was doing my sort of research for this talk, which is Cavendish's experiment to weigh the Earth, which was in 1798. And he used a device called a torsion balance. And this is... <coughs> This is an image taken from his uh, original paper. Uh, this is a mock-up of it in the Science Museum. And this is a diagram of what goes on. But essentially, you can see here there are two large spherical objects, M and M. And then suspended on a, from a wire in the centre is a, is a bar with two smaller spherical objects, two smaller balls hanging there. Uh, and and what, what happens is that the larger, larger balls are rotated round to approach the smaller balls, and then sitting on the stool here, there's a stool, so it shows you this is quite a considerably sized piece of apparatus. You would then look for the displacement in the small, uh, the small balls caused by the gravitational attraction of the large balls. These, is the, the, and the, these differences, these distances are really tiny. But from measuring the distance, you can gauge the force, um, the force of attraction, that, and the, the angle and the length and the torsion of the, the strength of the wire gives you, will eventually give you the, will give you the, the magnitude of the force attracting the two, the two masses. You already know the, the force of attraction of that mass to the Earth; it's its weight, and so by proportion you can therefore gauge the weight of the Earth. I mean, just a very clever experiment, especially consider, considering this was. Yes, 230 or 220 years ago. The results from this revealed that the density of the Earth is that value, 5.448 plus or minus 0 0.033. Physicists are very good at their uncertainties, grams per cubic centimetre. This is within 1.2% 1, 1 of the best determination today, which is that figure, which I think is a remarkable achievement at that time under those, under those laboratory conditions. The important uh, conclusion from this work is that it's significantly <coughs> greater than the density of the surface rocks, which are about uh, 2.7 to 3 at the most. Uh, and it implies that it, within the Earth there are denser materials at depth than you see at the surface of the rock. As a digression from this, it's interesting that although Cavendish gets all the credit, it wasn't his idea uh, and the method was originally devised uh, by a geologist, John Mitchell. And I just want to have a slide because this is the Geological Society and we should be, give credit to, uh, to um, uh, our, our ancestors, if you like. And John Mitchell is, lived in the uh, 18th century, natural philosopher and polymath and vicar. And he was one of the unsung heroes, as I say, as I say that, of early natural sciences. For two years, he held the Woodwardian Chair of Geology in Cambridge till he was obliged to relinquish it on his marriage. There you are. That's fantastic, isn't it? He was then banished, no, appointed to rector <laughs> of St Michael's Church of Thornhill near Leeds, uh, in, and, and he spent the rest of, rest of his life there. But he undertook con and continued to undertake scientific work, and that's where he built a prototype of Gavendish's torsion balance. <clears throat> He published papers uh, which, and he became a fellow of the Royal Society, 
And he continued to publish papers, it says, on astronomy, magnetism, geology, surveying, and seismology. And it's interesting that he also developed various ideas for this, and, and, and his ideas led on to seismology, uh, modern seismology, as we can we will see. Um, he also, in one of his papers, he, at the time he was impressed with the idea from Newton of the particulate nature of light, and he worked, and he, he, he developed that in such a way that he realised that a star emitting light, if the mass was great, then the particles of light couldn't get out and you would have a black hole. He, he, he didn't call them a black hole, but he developed the ideas of it, and is now, as you can see from the last paragraph, um, is, is uh, last bullet point I should say is now acknowledged by modern modern uh, modern uh, physics that he that he was one of the most brilliant and original scientists of his time. He remains virtually unknown today, uh, in part because he did little to develop and promote his own pulse breaking ideas. I mean, so much nothing really changes in science. You know, if you're not talking about your own science to the whole world, nobody's going to do it on your behalf. Um, contemporaries were less. Uh, less kind to him, and they just described him as a little short man of black complexion and fat, um, <laughs> which uh, I think in these politically cor correct times we might not be able to get away with. But anyway, that's a historical statement. Anyway, enough of John Mitchell. The, the next stage in understanding the structure of the Earth is uh, essentially uh, it develops from uh, seismology and the properties of seismic waves, which again an original observation from John Mitchell. He, re he recognised that the energy, uh, recognised that the energy given out by earthquakes is a wave, it has a waveform and and spreads out uh, from the epicentre. These were further developed by Robert Mallet, who was a Wallaston medalist in the, of this society in 1877, working in the 1850s and 60s, and then Richard Oldham in 1906, a past president. I have large shoes to fill here, because I have nothing as distinctive as this in my uh, CV, uh, made the distinction between the mantle and the core. And another bit of scientific history here. This is uh, on the, um, the Society's Nile collection. It's uh, published in the um, Proceedings. I think they were the Proceedings, or, or the Quarterly Journal. I can never remember. The Quarterly, the Quarterly yeah. Journal of the Geological Society, as it was then known. Um, <coughs> Uh, published, as you can see, by Mr. R. D. Oldham, um, FR, FGS. He was also became FRS as well. But he published this paper <coughs> on uh, what, what he really looking at the distance from, in degrees of arc, in other words, distance around the globe, right from the epicenter of an earthquake, and then looking, plot, looking at the arrival times of the signals of those earthquakes and plotting them at so distant, distance against time, and he found that there were two, two significant types of arrivals, one following that line, one following that. Uh, these we would now call S waves, and these would be called P waves. And he found that there was a discontinuity at about 120 degrees of arc. And this, we, and this he inferred was because the Earth has a structure like this with an outer, what we would call the mantle, and an inner core, which has, a different, which has different physical properties from from the, from the mantle outside. And uh, this, this is the first of these, of these sorts of diagrams which are very commonplace in, uh, in, in geology textbooks now. I put up here as well uh, more text from his introduction. And uh, this is, as I say, this is 1906, so 112 years ago, in this room. Of all the regions of the Earth, none invites speculation more than that which lies beneath our feet. And in none is speculation more dangerous. Yet apart from speculation, it is little that we can say regarding the constitution of the interior of the Earth. He then goes on to say, no, it's mean density, uh, and the temperature and density increase towards the centre, and all the rest of it. And it, then it goes on, many theories of the Earth have been propounded at different times. The central substance of the Earth has been supposed to be fiery, fluid, solid, and gaseous in turn, till geologists have turned in despair from the subject and become inclined to confine their attention to the outermost crust of the Earth, leaving its centre as a playground for the mathematician. I thought playgrounds and mathematicians, sort of my, son, my son does maths, and I, he likes a playground, but anyway. Um, it sort of struck me as interesting, and at, that, at the time, in the late, uh, late 19th, early 20th century, <coughs> the, um, excuse me, I'm going to have to get myself a glass of water, my voice is giving out.
Sorry about that. I, I, I had a cold last week, and I'm, I'm doing my best not to do a Theresa May on you. That's not a Brexit <laughs> reference. Uh, I, what I don't want to see is everything collapsing off the screen behind me. Um, <clears throat> yes, at the time, there was some debate about the age of the earth. Uh, we'd gone through all the religious debates in the, in the mid-19th century, and then the late 19th into 20th century. The physicists, exemplified by Lord Rayleigh, were were doing models about the thermal cooling of the Earth. And they're making the assumption that the Earth was cooling from a hot state by conduction, knowing the, grad the thermal gradient in the outer surfaces of the Earth. They calculated <coughs> that the age of the Earth was about 40 to 50 million years. The geologists, of course, having gone out and looked at some rocks, which is more than a physicist ever does or a mathematician, uh, knew that, that in order to account for mountain building erosion, more mountain building biological evolution that the Earth must be hundreds if not thousands of million years old. So until radiometric dating, this was, there, there was that huge debate. And I think that, uh, that, that, that comment at the end as a, as, as a playground for mathematicians uh, refers to that discussion that was going on at the time. A really interesting insight into the development of our science. Anyway, seismology and the structure of the Earth continued to develop during the 20th century. There was Mohorovic, who discovered the Moho discontinuity. So much easier to say Moho, isn't it? The Moho <laughs> discontinuity between the crust and the mantle, just below the crust. Uh, Howard Jeffries <coughs> determined that the, uh, in 1926, determined that the outer core was liquid. And then Inga Lehman, uh, the first woman to have been mentioned in this, uh, <coughs> I am doing it, Theresa May, aren't I? Uh, that found that the inner core was solid. And there was sub subsequent discovery of seismic discontinuities within the mantle uh, to make lower and upper divisions. And now this is a modern view of depth versus veloc seismic velocity, and the P waves follow that. There's a lot of jiggling around in the upper mantle, very smooth uh, progression in the, in, the, in the lower mantle, then a drop as you go into the liquid outer core, and then the slight increase as you go into the solid inner core. <coughs> and that is, is really, in a, in a way, the, the, the key behind understanding this, the structure of the Earth. And so when you get to 1960, your, your president was uh, an enthusiastic pupil of Little Munden JMI School and reading uh, various science, uh, what was available then, the science encyclopedia. It was a time of... Uh, interesting cars and even more interesting headgear, um, <laughs> but our vision of the Earth in, a, in, a, in, in the Britannic Encyclopedia would look something like this. Uh, really, quite a simple model. But what the, thing, the question then becomes: What is the Earth made of? The gross structure of the Earth is well defined. Seismology will give us the density of each layer as well as its seismic velocity. What we don't know is the bulk composition <coughs> or the composition of the individual layers. And to find out that, we have to look outside the Earth to the leftovers of the formation of the solar system. This um, is a very brief summary of how the solar system was formed in uh, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Whoops. In five simple images. And it's essentially a condensation from a large... Du uh, cloud of dust and gas that gradually condenses, warms up, becomes contracts to a spinning disk, and eventually you form the star in the centre of the sun, and then the planets around the outside. That's a messy process, produces the planets, and this is a lovely montage of images from various NASA missions, but it produces a lot of debris in the form of the asteroids, which orbit between Mars, largely orbit between Mars and Jupiter in the solar system. And we know from tra the trajectories of uh, observed mete meteor, um, meteor falls uh, on Earth, that that's the source of the majority of meteorites. And when we look at meteorites, as I say, they're debris from the birth of the solar system. They can be divided into, into stony meteorites. This is a nice... I love this classification. It's stones, stony irons, and irons. What's not to like about that? It's uh, pretty straightforward. Um, and they have these wonderful textures, and this is a, an iron meteorite that's been etched to show this what's called Widmanstaten uh, uh, structure within it, um, which is related to the cooling of this from a liquid state and crystallisation. Uh, the stones, these, this is a chondritic, what's called a chondritic meteorite, so-called because it contains 
These chondrules, which are millimetre-sized droplets of silicates, mainly olivine and, clino and pyroxenes, but uh, which, which have condensed, which are droplets that have condensed out and then crystallised. And then in between, you have these stony ions, which, which are the most beautiful. And if, if, uh, if you ever go to meteorite auctions, go for tens of thousands of pounds, and you can understand why. This is, these are gem-quality olivines, and you can see the size of them in relation to this person's fingers uh, uh, in, a, in a, an, an, iron, an iron matrix, rather beautiful samples. So given this is what meteorites look like, we then look at the, what are called the differentiated meteorites, and the stones, the ones without chondrules, the achondrites, have textures and minerals that are similar to terrestrial rocks, such as basalt and peridotite, and they're thought to represent the mantle or the crust. They're rocks, that we, rocks similar to materials we might see on Earth. The irons, because of their density, uh, are, are, are dominated by iron nickel, uh, with, with sulphides, phosphides, and other oxygen poor minerals would represent the core. And then the stony ions would represent a material at the boundary between the, the, the core and the mantle of, of the body from which the meteorite was derived, and just fr fr in a sense <coughs> freezing, uh, freezing the process of, of ions separating from, from silicate material. So we end up with a basic planetary structure. You can read that for yourself while I take another sip of water. It looks largely like this. <coughs> so we have a crust, <coughs> which we know is granitic and, or, and, and, with, and with basaltic material, an upper mantle made largely of peridotite, although there was some dispute. Uh, uh, I can remember in the 60s and 70s, whether it was eclogitic, in other words, like, like basalt, or whether it was peridotite, but it turns out that it's peridotite, and in an outer core of liquid iron with nickel in it as well, and an inner core of solid iron. And that is really the structure that we understand today. But is this correct for the Earth? And if so, when did planetary differentiation occur? So when did the Earth acquire this structure? That was always, we thought, an unanswerable question, but actually it is known quite, we, we now do understand that. <coughs> when I first started my research career in the 1970s, I was fascinated to find out that you could actually get your hand on samples of the mantle. This goes back to Oldham sort of saying how geologists have restricted their attention to the outer layers of the earth. So the concentration was on granites and basalts and sediments and metamorphic rocks that, you've, that you find in abundance at the surface. But actually, if you look in the right places, uh, and in some, for example, in some volcanic eruptions, you find these little, these, these variable, these lumps, what are called xenoliths, strange rocks, that occur, that are brought up by the volcanic eruptions. And these occur largely in basalts, rocks called basalts, and in kimberlites, which are the source rocks of, uh, of diamonds. They also find them tectonically emplaced in the basal, basal layers of ophiolites and uh, massive peridotites emplaced in. Um, in origin in mountain belts. Lertz in the Pyrenees is a very good example. Lertz is the type example of the rock Lertzolite. Anyway, the, this, um, we find there are two types. In, in basaltic rocks, we find these lovely green rocks called, uh, which, are, which, are dominate, which are peridotites, <coughs> dominated by olivine, the green mineral, plus some clinoperoxine, and, and an aluminium rich called spinel, which is a magnesium aluminium oxide. And this is a an outcrop, um, an exposure in Hawaii, I think, or maybe in uh, San Carlos in New Mexico, I can't remember which, hammer for scale, about a foot long, 30 centimetres in new money, and you can see the abundance of these mantle xenoliths, which cover about 50% of that outcrop. So these, these things are not, if you look in the right place, they're not hard to find. And if you go to a kimberlite, <coughs> you will find that the aluminium-rich phase in these is um, a pink mineral called garnet. And they produce these rather beautiful rocks. Again, the matrix is olivine, and the pink is garnet. Uh, and the bright green, which I can't make out from here, but hopefully I think there's one there, uh, is, is uh, a, a jade-rich um, pyro pyroxene. So there are these two types that we find in different locations, uh, spinel peridotite and garnet peridotite. And when we look at these rocks, 
Um, as soon as people realised they were bits of the mantle, they started squeezing them and heating them up and doing experiments on them. And we find that if you plot the temperature against pressure, then as the temperature goes up, eventually the thing will melt, and that's the solidus, that's when it, it melts. Uh, and at low pressures, you, the, the aluminium phase is plagioclase, then it goes to spinel prismatite, which is this. So that's, that's lowish pressure. And then at higher pressures, you get these garnet prismatites here. So that, this begins to make a lot of sense. And also, these are, the, this is, this, these are the estimated geotherms, the rate at which temperature increases inside the Earth. And as you can see, in all, in all places, in all places, the mantle, this material is solid for all of those conditions within the Earth. So one, it's solid. Two, it's got the right minerals. And then this is just a plot to show pressure again, which is depth, so shallow to deep, temperature going up. And you can analyse the minerals, the garnet and the peroxines in here, and derive the temperature and the pressure at which they formed. <laughs> so crystallise, plot them again, plot one against the other, and you, you end up with, with this, these rather nice uh, arrays of data, which show that, and this is three locations in southern Africa, and it shows you where, uh, from the conditions from which these, uh, these, these garnet peridotites were derived. And they're good mantle. The, the mantle, the, man, the moho, is, is at uh, uh, 10 kilobars. <clears throat> so these are definitely in the mantle. This is the graphite to diamond transition. So we know that, for example, in northern Lesotho, that the rocks that carried these to the surface were derived from, great, from the diamond stability field. And indeed, we find diamond-bearing kimberlites in northern Lesotho. So there is, and this is used as a prospecting tool in many ways um, when new kimberlite fields are, are found. It's very easy, it's much easier to find mantle xenoliths to determine their pressures and temperatures of formation than it is to sift 25 tonnes of rock and find out how many diamonds there are in it. Okay, and you can, as, as time went on, these, these rock samples were squeezed to higher temperatures and higher pressures, uh, and... The, the, and the, the, what happens, as you, this is depth here, and this is the volume fraction of different minerals. And as the pressure goes up, the olivine does, it goes through these transformations into high-pressure polymorphs. And then the garnet eats up the, the peroxines, and eventually you end up with essentially an olivine garnet rock. And then suddenly, at about just below 600 kilometres, everything changes, and you end, into, you end up with these very, stray, these very unusual high-pressure minerals. Bridgmanite, which you've probably never heard of, is the most common mineral in the earth. Which um, I think is, well, that's a useful take-home QI sort of fact. Um, but what is interesting is that the pressures at which these transformations occur, particularly in olivine, correspond to the secondary seismic discontinuities in the earth. So there's a really good tie in there between the geophysics and the experimental petrology uh, of, of peridotites. So we're getting really... We get it, we're getting a good idea now that the mantle is definitely made of peridotite. Real samples give mantle pressures and temperatures. Phase changes correspond to seismic observations. <coughs> we are now in a position to investigate core formation. But to do that, as it says, a bit of, we need to understand the bulk earth composition and a bit of basic geochemistry. So this is where you know, you've all got to pay attention because I'll be testing you on this later. Anyway, we go back to the periodic table. Um, the, this is the playground of, of, uh, of modern geochemistry. We can now analyse the abundance of virtually every element, naturally occurring element, on that table in any, in any geological... I'd say any, yes, let's say any geological sample and determine the isotope ratios of the, of the element in those samples. <coughs> Some of them are a bit challenging because they're only present in a, in a few parts per billion in any rock. So there's a lot of clever chemistry goes on. But, but this, is what, what, this, is, this, is, this is our toolbox, if you like. Within that, we have a number of classifications. In, in white, and that's essentially, or gray, pale gray, the, the noble gases, carbon, ni ni nitrogen, carbon, and hydrogen, are classed as atmophile. They like to be in the gas phase. They, they occur in, uh, in, 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 in the atmosphere. So atmophile, uh, uh, well, the atmosphere or the hydrosphere on Earth. Lithophile, your knowledge of the classics should tell you, is rock-loving, and uh, those are the elements in red. And this is where an awful lot of the geochemistry that I've done over the past 30-odd years has been focused on these sorts of elements here. 
and we've been analysing those furiously, I would say. So we understand their geochemistry well. But then there are siderophile or iron-loving elements, which are these in orange, okay? And those, those we would expect to be concentrated in the core of our Earth model. And then these in the cross-hatching are chalcophile. Uh, they like to, they associate with sulphur. Um, I'm not going to talk about the uh, chalcophile elements. I've never really worked with them, but I have a colleague at the Open University who could talk for hours on end about them, and you should invite her to give a talk. Um, but what I want to do is concentrate. Now, first of all, the elements I'm going, we're going to look at are hafnium and tungsten, uh, and, and then we will also be looking at helium as well. So a lithophile uh, and a siderophile element and then an atomophile element. Uh, but before that, we need just to go through the basis for the bulk composition of the Earth, which is now is based on uh, chondritic meteorites. In other words, the, the ones with those beautiful chondrules in it, in them. Uh, and these, we think, are samples of the primitive material of the solar nebula. We can tell from the lead isotopes that they, they have an, they are some of the old, amongst the oldest materials we, we know of, but 4.567 thousand million years, or giga years. Um, it's an easy number to remember. It ends with four. It starts with four and ends with seven. You've just got to remember to put the decimal point in the right place. Uh, so, 4,567 million years ago, a, a, an <laughs> enormous span of time. Uh, and when we compare the constant, the, uh, the 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 composition of these, and this is the uh, the abundance of various elements, all the elements in the periodic table, or many of the elements in the periodic table, in carbonaceous chondrites, these, in these, these materials, and you compare them with the abundance of those elements in the solar photosphere, determined through astronomical spectroscopy, you find that the majority of the elements, they lie in this fantastic one-to-one -one straight line. I think this is one of the really... one of, one of the major discoveries and one of the clinching, the clinching points of... Um, of um, understanding of planetary, planetary geochemistry is, is that you've got to, that we have a good handle on the primitive stuff that made up, that makes up the solar system. These meteorites that fall to Earth, four and a half thousand million years old, and made and represent very similar to what's going on in the sun. There are differences. You can see these are all the noble gases, the atmophile elements, and here as well. These are slightly depleted in the meteorites. And the lithium is enriched, and that's because lithium is involved in the nuclear processes in the sun. But generally speaking, this one-to-one -one correlation is a very good basis for understanding the composition of the Earth as being chondritic. Based on that, we can then analyse a series of elements within the mantle. And these are lithophile elements, the major elements that make up the mantle. These are trace elements in the mantle. And these all, and this is normalised concentration to chondrite. And you would expect if a chondritic earth, they're close to, they're, they're going to be one, which they are. Okay. Then you get into the moderately siderophile elements. I mean, you'd think iron was the strongest siderophile element, but actually iron state partitions between the metal phase and the silicate phase in earth differentiation. Uh, and we find that they're depleted by an order of magnitude. This is a logarithmic scale, so one down to 0.1. And then the really hydro highly siderophile elements are, are depleted by nearly three orders of magnitude. And this is one of the reasons why the, and the Earth's crust, these are, these, are, these are precious metals. They're so rare because they've all been sucked out of the silicate part of the Earth and put in the core. Anyway, this gives us an opportunity to distinguish between different models of planetary accretion and core formation. One of them is that the Earth. Uh, the, the mantle had this, has its composition because the Earth, first of all, accreted iron to iron meteorites and then more silicate meteorites on top. And the mixing between those gave, gives, gives you the, this, uh, this pattern in the mantle. The, the other possibility is that the Earth accreted homogeneously. Materials were all fell into the Earth uh, relatively rapidly. The heat, the, the heat of, of uh, gravitational potential energy melted the whole thing and then the core separated, heating it up even more. And so we end up with a process that is rapid and hot. So do we have a slow, cold model or a rapid hot? 
that, and that was a big question going through right the way through the, the uh, latter part of the 20th century until the advent of uh, tungsten isotopes, um, which I'm now going to briefly explain. Don't bother about the details, but anyway, we have two elements here, and I mentioned them, hafnium and tungsten. One of them is lithophile, the other one is siderophile. In a system of the mantle with a core separating, it, the, 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 the core, the metal, will suck the, the, most of the tungsten out of the mantle and leave <coughs> the hafnium there. The interesting thing about these two is that hafnium has, uh, or had, a, a short-lived radioactive isotope, well, short-lived nine million years half-life. That's short for geology, by the way. Um, and that decays to tungsten 182 via beta decay. While the hafnium is extant, this isotope ratio slowly increases. In other words, while it's alive. But if anything happens to fractionate this, in other words, this process, separate the hafnium from the tungsten, it'll be reflected in the tungsten isotopes of the mantle. So what we're looking for is a difference between the tungsten isotopes in the mantle and the tungsten isotopes in chondritic meteorites. And the next slide shows the data that were published in about 2002 in two or three papers in Nature. This was really groundbreaking stuff. And it's summarised in the top left here. All of terrestrial rocks we've ever analysed uh, have been shown to have... This, this is the measure of the tungsten excess in those of about zero. In other words, relative to the Earth, the chondrites have a lower amount of tungsten 182, and the iron meteorites have even less. And the, and the consequence of that is really that there is a difference in the tungsten 182 in the mantle compared to chondrites, and it means core formation must have happened within a few half-lives, right, of the, um, of, of the, uh, the, the, the hafnium 182, because it's only, it's only around for... Uh, two or three, two or three half lives. By the time you've had about three half lives, uh, sort of, uh, so tw thirty or thirty million years, it's all, it's virtually all gone, and you can't measure the different the effect on that. So it means that that fractionation, that separation of hafnium from tungsten, must have happened <coughs> within thirty million years of Earth accretion. This implies that the accretion of the Earth was very rapid. The core separated because it had to happen rapidly, and then the core was separated during the accretion process, and so. The energy of accretion and the gravitational separation of the core is more than enough energy to melt the whole Earth. And so we end up with a model of a magma ocean and a hot early Earth, which is highly inhospitable and of a very unstable surface. Fre I say there are frequent eruptions and a lack of permanent <coughs> crust. There would have been probably lakes of lava, lakes of magma on the surface. The surface temperature would have been up at... Up at many hundreds of degrees Celsius and the temperatures inside sufficient to melt the whole mantle. That's why the earliest dates of anything on Earth, which are from detrital zircons, are, are somewhat younger. The very oldest is 4.4 giga years, but the earliest permanent crust is 3.9 to 4 giga years. So, so it took half a billion years for the Earth really to cool down and stabilise enough so, so that the Earth could sustain continental, what, we, what we now might recognise as continental rocks. And over the subsequent four and a half thousand million years, uh, the Earth has cooled from that state to something today where we actually have plate tectonics going on, which is the, the dominant mechanism for heat loss in the Earth. And it's led to the development of ideas of mantle convection, cycling of material from the surface into the mantle, and the parallel development of the concept of mantle plumes, and hence the use of isot um, of oceanic basalts to map mantle heterogeneity. So differences in the mantle both laterally and, and by inference, uh, in depth. So mantle plumes, just to go, go through, this is the classic example of Hawaii, erupt, currently active here, then a chain of islands and a chain of seamounts stretching across the Pacific plate and an abrupt branch there forming the Emperor Seamount chain going north to be subducted eventually in the Aleutian Trench. Up here. And this is a, a <coughs> cartoon section to explain that. And this is essentially hot material rising from a mantle plume which impinges on the base of the lithosphere and is melting there and then comes through and erupts at the surface. As the plate moves away, you form another island. And these are islands are gradually eroded away and disappear below the surface. Uh, there's also this notion of... Uh, Starting when a plume starts, uh, arguably from the core mantle boundary, a hot material rises up 
uh, impinges on the base of the lithosphere and you form flood basalts like, uh, such as the Deccan, uh, which were 65 million years ago, coincident with the, ex the extinction of dinosaurs and other things. And then as, as, as it stabilises, you end up with a volcanic trail, and you can see that in various examples uh, across the, uh, where, where the continents have split apart uh, uh, in, the, in the oceans today. Um, they also developed the idea of mantle convection. In other words, that the mantle, although solid, actually moves on a very long time scale. And you have to have that if you're going to have plate tectonics moving around on the surface. Uh, the idea is really this one. It, this is a very early diagram, uh, but still current on Wikipedia, I might add, and is completely wrong. Um, and so don't believe everything you see on Wikipedia. Um, this is, this is a more uh, uh, somewhat better, better diagram, which, which sort of shows the idea of plates, plates subducting into the mantle and being contorted and sort of uh, accumulating at the bottom of the mantle and mantle plumes rising up and then passive, passive extension and melting at mid-ocean ridges there. And this is a, computer, a numerical computer simulation of mantle convection. Um, I don't understand the details... But it's, but it's been run, for, run in model time for a few hundred million years, and it shows the way in which materials that start at the surface get subducted down, fall down, and get mixed up and contorted within the deep mantle. Um, and so mantle convection is, is easy to say. It's, very, it's quite challenging to describe and fully understand. But the mantle moves around, of that there is no doubt. And we also have the modern... Uh, modern use of uh, seismic waves, to, uh, which can be used uh, in the form of uh, mantle tomography, which is like a, a well, some of you may have had a CAT scan in, in hospital where you use X-rays uh, or other other radiation to to, uh, to 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 scan the inside of your body and create a three-dimensional model of what's going on inside. This we're doing the same with earthquake waves to see what's going on inside the Earth. And one of the great triumphs of this is the identification of these, of the, these great zones of um, seismically slow and therefore arguably cold material that, is, that are rooted at the, at the surface where there are subduction zones and going down into the deep mantle. And this is really good visual evidence for the presence of subduction and material sinking into the deep mantle. Visualising mantle plumes is more difficult, and you just end up with this sort of stuff, which I'm just not going to go into at the moment, but is uh, somewhat less convincing. Anyway, we can use this understanding of the way of where basalts are derived and, uh, to, um, to, to, to understand compositional differences between the shallow mantle as sampled beneath mid-ocean ridges and the deep mantle as sampled by mantle plumes and erupted in ocean islands. So the different, the, what we're looking at is the difference between mid-ocean ridge basalts and ocean island basalts. And one of, the most, um, one of the most useful discriminants in this has been helium isotopes. And there's, quite a, there's a huge industry in people analysing the, the isotopes of the noble gases, but helium is the easiest to understand. Helium consists of two isotopes, helium-3, helium-4. Helium-3 is formed in the Big Bang... And it has a very low abundance on Earth because helium is atmophile and, and, and is lost in, in, in processes, in various geological processes that are, that are, that are hot. Uh, and also it, it, it has a, a velocity in the atmosphere the, so that helium escapes out to space very easily. That's why the atmosphere only has about five parts per million of helium, most of which is helium-4 which is essentially an alpha particle and derives mainly from the radioactive decay of uranium and thorium. And its highest abundance is therefore in the continental crust. The atmospheric ratio of these two is 1.4 times 10 to the minus 6. So, but we, so we normalise everything to that ratio. So again, analytically very challenging to do this, but uh, there are numerous laboratories in the world that have done that. And, and when we look at helium isotopes in ocean ridge basalts, and this, this is work that is uh, reviewed by a colleague of mine, David Graham, uh, in 2002, they find that the, the, the helium-3-4 ratio in ocean, uh, ocean ridge basalts from the South, North Atlantic, Indian Ocean and Pacific, all remarkably constant. They're all between 
well, 8 point, as you can see, 8.08 to 8.24 is their mean. Uh, these are the sample <coughs> sizes, uh, and these are standard deviations. Um, uh, I won't go into the statistics, because I know there's somebody in the audience who knows more about this than I do. Uh, but um, but the, it, it is a remarkably constant value throughout the whole, the, the whole Earth of these... Um, of, of, uh, <coughs> For, for these ocean ridge basalts. And you can see when you plot, this is a plot of helium 3 4 ratio against latitude going from along the North and South Atlantic, so from Iceland, north of Iceland, down to 60 degrees south in the Southern Ocean. And you can see between here, this is rem these values are remarkably constant. And then you get to Iceland, which is where there's a, 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 a large mantle plume, and the, and, the, and the ratios go off through the roof like that. And don't ignore that diagram. Um, this is a review from uh, two years ago, 2017, yes, two years ago, by Jackson et al. In, published in Nature, which reviewed all of the uh, helium-3-4 measurements in ocean island basalts. This is the mid-ocean ridge range down here, about eight, plus or minus a bit. And then most of these ocean island basalts have elevated ratios. The maximum values that you find there go up. And in, uh, in, in Iceland, this is now the maximum is up near 50 which is very high, and I certainly know that Afar, which is uh, Ethiopia, we have samples that we, 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 go, we now go up to 21. So there are, there are, there are values, in, there are very distinct differences between the range and the maximum values of helium isotopes in ocean island basalts compared with mid-ocean ridge basalts. So the mantle today, according to helium, going back to the physical models, mean, suggests that the upper mantle as sampled by mid-ocean ridge basalt, is remarkably homogeneous, which would mean it's well mixed. So it's, begin it's looking like you know, this, sort of, this sort of mantle convection model as, as done in, uh, by these numerical sim simulations. The source of mantle plumes, on the other hand, is heterogeneous. In other words, much more variable and hence not well mixed. So that's an interesting one. But it also contains relatively high concentrations of helium-3. Remember, this is the primordial isotope. This is not created in the Earth. This must be inherited from the, uh, the, from the solar nebula uh, from very early stages in Earth's history. So despite the really violent and energetic early Earth, remember back to our model derived from the tungsten isotopes about the rapid, the rapid formation of the core and the hot, uh, the hot mantle of magma oceans, primordial, va primordial volatiles have been somehow retained deep within the mantle or maybe even in the core, and I just add that in as a proviso at the end. So there are these rather contradictory elements that we're getting from geochemistry that say we should be actually depleted in volatiles, but actually, despite that energetic early Earth, we still can have evidence of primordial volatiles uh, remaining deep within the Earth. And, so, and the story continues. And I always end, uh, when I'm ta whenever I mention talks about discussing the mantle, with this uh, tomographic Im image of, um, or tomographic images of the Afar plume. This is the, Af the Afar plume here, and Ethiopia down here. This is the Afar triangle, and that's where the plume is centred. Volcanically, one of the, a very volcanically active area, and the subject of quite intense research over the past 20 years. And these seismic, ref uh, seismic tomographic images across there show a wealth of detail that is difficult to interpret but suggests that there's, there might well be hot, seismically slow material deep within the Earth beneath, beneath this part of the world. But I draw your attention on here to the green line, which is at 200 kilometres. And there's, there's, there is very little that we can sample at the surface of the Earth that comes from below that depth. So really what we, what we know about the deep Earth is... Is fairly, it's fairly good down to 200 kilometres, but our interpretation of relating the variations in the composition of basalts or even xenoliths to anything going on deeper is, I would suggest, not much more than informed speculation at times. And really referring back to Oldham's talk of how much speculation was involved in 1906 about, the, about the, the, the interior of the Earth, I think we're in a better position. We do know a lot about the physical, the physical structure of the Earth, but we're still, I think, struggling to reconcile the chemical signals that we're getting out of the centre of the Earth, but there are some tantalising clues as to what goes on down there. My voice is nearly given out. I haven't degenerated in Theresa May, and I thank you very much for your attention.
Yeah, good. Terrific. Thank you, Nick. Questions? Is fracking a risk to the crust? There's a microphone. Would you like to say your question again? Is fracking a risk to the crust? Fracking? I'm not an expert on fracking. I'm just not going to answer that question. <laughs> Great talk. Um, when you showed the uh, uh, Hawaiian plume, yep. um, and there was a trail, it heads straight, it heads straight for Hong Kong, but for some reason, many, many years ago, there was a sudden divergence and it, it, it moves up to um, uh, Vladivostok. I just wondered why there was that big noticeable kink. It's, that's, it, that's, yep. that's that, that, well, let me answer that first. Uh, I mean, the, that's, that sort of, that's a movement in the direction of plate, uh, plate motion at that time, which I think is 60, I can't remember, maybe it's 45 million years ago. Um, and it, and it, it, I can't remember what it relates to, but there are, there's an awful lot of plate reorganization going on at about that time. So, so suddenly, suddenly the Pacific plate, part, having, uh, having been move, moving in that direction, suddenly starts moving in that direction. Thank you. And the second thing is, why are there, why are there these uh, persistent hot plumes coming up um, in the mantle, why aren't they tran transitory? You know, why, 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 why do they last for so, so long? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, geologically, they last for 100 to 200 million years. Um, and once they get going, perhaps they're difficult to stop before. Uh, I, I'm struggling, really. I'm not quite sure why that is. Um, but they, they certainly start and then they gradually peter out. Uh, and you can track that, certainly the, when you make estimates of the temperature of these, of these deep areas of the Earth from the, the magmas that are erupted, the rocks that are erupted, the temperature, the, the, the main temperature does decline with time. So they, they start off with a blob and then material follows, follows up, but it, but, it, but it gradually declines. But because rocks are solid, and this is solid state, solid state motion, it, 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 takes a, it takes hundreds of million, uh, sort of tens to hundreds of millions of years for them to die down. But yes, they, they do, like, they are, I mean, certainly the Hawaiian plume, which is in terms of mass transfer is the biggest one on the planet, they, they certainly are persistent. Now for a controversial question. <laughs> Given the increasing activity of uh, the amount of plumes, and, and the increase in temperature, could it be that that is causing the melting of the interface, of, in the interface between glaciers and the surface of the planet, and to cause glaciers to slide off, and the general increase in temperature no. known as global warming? Uh, the short answer is no. Um, the longer answer is there's no evidence that plume activity is increasing. In fact, it could, we it could well be declining. When you look at when you look at the uh, the mean temperature of eruption of mag magmatic rocks over the whole history of the Earth, they are now uh, 150 degrees centigrade cooler on average than they were at uh, three and a half billion years. So there is a secular this plumes and plate tectonics are the way the Earth is getting rid of its heat and it's gradually cool it, things are gradually cooling down. So there's no evidence for that. The only way in which a plume could, uh, or something going on in the mantle could affect a glacier was if it, if, is if it impinges right below, and it happens in Antarctica, where hot material is erupted because, the, um, because uh, one of the seas is, is an extensional basin, there are volcanoes there, and if you get a volcano erupting under ice, then you can, you can melt the ice. But it's not, it's, no way is it a cause of you know, glac glacial, glacial erosion on the, big, on the scale we're seeing globally. Thank you. A long time ago in my youth, they were planning to drill down to the Moho discontinuity yep. in the middle of the ocean. Yep. Did they do that? No, they didn't. Uh, largely because what happens is the deeper you go, the, 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 the greater the lithostatic pressure, and the rocks just close the hole up before you can drill, and the drill gets stuck. The Russians have uh, did so project moho 
mohole in the 1960s didn't get through to the mohole, though, but it, but it did spawn the ocean drilling project that is going on today and, uh, and is, gives us so much information about the, uh, the, history, the history of the oceans and the structure of the ocean floor. The Russians did try a deep borehole in the Kola Peninsula, um, again in the 1970s, and I think that got down to five kilometres. I can't remember what it was. But again, they suffered from the same thing. It all, it all gets too hot, and the rock, and the rock just sort of is, becomes too plastic uh, and, and fills, fills the hole up and, jam, and jams up the drill bit. Thanks. OK. Thank you. I thought that was an interesting story, if talking about truth, about devolution and beginning with Dante's take on a teaching based upon a matter of our environment and not the matter of our environment? I don't think I really understand the point you're making. OK, well, I could explain it simplistically and quite quickly with a figure called cyclotron hex. So if you think of a big circle, circle surrounds, and within which is a diamond shape, the diametron, representing our environment, the third Orencia, just our world where we are. And that's split in the middle by a point of conversion called Hegesteronia, giving us the pyramid above and the pyramid below. Yes. That's the pyramid that is. That is the only pyramid that does exist. And the pyramid reflects, which is a variance of the truth, which is anything else <coughs> other than the pyramid above. And so at a time of interruption, which can, can inform this conversation, we can arrive at that point of conversion, which is called Hegesteronia. Which is like a big lagoon where the blossom goes above. And the I, blossom I just goes think below. I think we're approaching this problem from two different worldviews, <laughs> and my worldview is very different from yours. I think I'd like to move on to another question. Thank you. Okay, we want to take just a second longer. And we can look up to the pyramid above, which is the pyramid that is, which is called the pyramid of Christ, and it is the word of God, and learn something about it, such as Protocol One, which is God exists. <laughs> okay. I, I I I don't I, I don't think we're going to have that discussion now. Thank you. Well, it's just a doctrine of truth with quantum philosophy. With quantum I, I think I made the point right at the beginning. I made the point yeah. at the beginning that, I mean, I'm a physical scientist, and I, I'm, I'm very concerned about notions of absolute truth. I think we, we establish scientific models and we test them. We don't necessarily have beliefs as such that are not based on a rational understanding of our environment, of our solid earth, and of the way in which materials behave. And I think that's the statement I would make. And I think leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. How does your helium-3 stay within the earth for so oh, long? That's the $64,000 question. <laughs> I mean, um, that... It is, it, it, it is there in measurable and repeatable quantities uh, and in a variety of rocks that have these deep sources, even the shallow sources. The first, the first place where this was recognised in, uh, in, um, the, uh, on the Earth and came as an enormous surprise was looking at plumes uh, in the ocean that uh, emanate from, that actually turn out to emanate from mid-ocean ridges. This was made by Harmon Craig in the 1960s, and it was one of those sort of almost Nobel, there was not a Nobel Prize for Earth Sciences, <coughs> but he, he, should have, he should have won something similar. It's a fantastic observation. So you do find this helium-3 coming out of places where the, where the mantle is degassing, where in other words it's losing heat, it's losing magma, and it's losing volatiles. Where it actually sits, is, is really problematic because, as I say, we've gone through this, we, we have, we've developed this notion of the Earth where it's gone through this early stage, which is extremely hot, completely molten, and with volatiles just being lost to, lost to outer space. And yet, somehow, the Earth has managed to hold on to he, some helium-3 and 4. And I, I would be, I'm not an expert in that area, uh, and I would be uh, reluctant to, to say definitely where it is, because I've just said oh, we don't believe in truths, but we actually are trying to develop testable models as to whether it might be resident in the core, and therefore the heat transfer and helium transfer to the core, to the base of these mantle plumes, is then transporting things to the surface, or it's stored somewhere in the deep mantle. But it's difficult to answer that question. Can we have one final question? 
If not, Nick, if I can yes, use yes, this yes. podium just to give some thanks. I always wondered what you did. <laughs> <laughs> and um, that you've given us a, a, a fascinating and um, very informative and uh, very amusing um, <laughs> account of how our understanding of the deep earth has, has developed over the uh, recent centuries. I'm absolutely amazed how, was it Athanasius yeah. Kircher, how close he got it right in 1662. I don't know what he was eating, drinking, or maybe even smoking, smoking but um, <laughs> he had a very vivid imagination, that's for sure. And I've also learnt one new piece of geological jargon this evening as well. What was it? Web bowl? Web? Oh, web bowl. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Sorry, can I, yes, I'll, yes. I'll file that one away for future years. But, yeah. but seriously, Nick, that was a tremendously informative um, an entertaining account of how our knowledge has developed over the years. And I thank you so much uh, for your time this evening. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.